Hi, I'm George at The Antique Nomad with daily posts on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, live streams on Periscope, and weekly videos, maybe more to come, on YouTube. Centralia, Washington, which is the focus of today's episode, is halfway between Seattle and Portland, and it is the Northwest Vintage and Antique Trading Center. There's 450 dealers who've filled this 1910s railroad town with a immeasurable amount of interesting goods. We're going to look at the original antique mall today, Centralia Square. Centralia Square holds a real soft spot in my heart because it's where I started in the antique business a few decades ago and it's still one of the best antique malls in the West, so let's go see why. So this is the home of Centralia Square Antique Mall. It is the original antique mall in Centralia, which is now a destination with almost 500 antique dealers. This was the very first building that converted to an antique mall. It was originally an Elks Lodge built by Joseph Woleb, the architect who designed a lot of the Washington State Capitol and was Washington's first resident architect back in 1920. And they told him it was massively over-engineered, that he had put way too much energy into it. And then there was a big earthquake in 1949. It was the only building that sustained zero damage, so everybody changed their tune. It became Centralia Square in 1986 and has now been restored into its original guise, which was a hotel for the Elks back then. We're going to walk up into the foyer here. Today we're going to mainly tour the antique mall. We will eventually come back and show you the hotel. It's a pretty neat place with an amazing gathering spot. This is on the National Register of Historic Places. And we're going to open the door here and walk into the foyer. There is a restaurant at the end of the hall and a restaurant next to us and then the upstairs to the hotel and here's the antique mall entrance. Now you come down the stairs and the antique mall occupies the entire basement of this old place. So you're greeted by a whole lot of pictures along the staircase and then you walk down into the main part of the mall there are over 50 dealers here, and it is quite a wide variety of antiques and vintage items. So let's take a look. We'll just start right here at the beginning. This space has a lot of beautiful art glass, which has been very popular here, uh, but a lot of other interesting showcase items as well. Everything from Steiff monkeys and critters and historic baseball cards to this beautiful Victorian glass painted piece with the bird neck. This is a Weller pottery piece, the fox pole here. We're going to pull out and go around the corner here. You'll see there's quite a lot here in store. So let's go into this front space. This has a really beautiful secretary desk, oak from the 1890s with the carved winged beasts on the side. That is an unusual piece for sure. The artwork you're seeing here is Ree Munoz. She's one of the most celebrated Alaskan artists. And a lot of these were done between the 1950s and the 1990s. She originally went up there to work as a teacher and was so taken by the people that she stayed there, became an artist, and spent the rest of her life there. We'll pass by here. This space to our right here has a pretty amazing old coffee tin from the 1880s or 90s and this really cool oak refrigerator and a lot of kitchen stuff. And then you'll see quite a bit of Native American in this space, a lot of Northwest Native basketry. Uh, there's more in the showcase here. The flint points and arrowheads are all uh, genuine. In fact, all these pieces have been uh, vetted to be certain that they are indeed what they say they are. The bowl maker is a Francoma piece in the case there. We're going to turn slowly back around so that you can see the case behind me here. There's some more high-powered Native American in this case too. I see some older pieces, some really good moccasins, an early macaw basket, some good Apache and Hopi pieces. So there really is a nice selection here if Western memorabilia, Native American is your thing. There's jewelry, there's basketry, there's ceramics. In terms of regular jewelry, or what most people think of as jewelry, there's quite a bit of that as well. Uh, there's a case here that has several pieces of Bakelite. 
we see some Juliana pieces in there and more down below here. You'll see the Easter egg set in the front here. That's a very hard pattern to find from the mid 60s. There are some other bright pieces too. This very candy colored magenta and red set is Weiss from the late 60s as well. Got a butterfly pin there. Some really neat stuff. Down on the bottom, this is an unusual piece. It is a Bauer oil jar. Bauer pottery originated in Paducah, Kentucky as a crockware maker and then they moved to Los Angeles and became an artware maker and that's from the 1930s from that. Fenton was made in West Virginia of course until about uh, eight or ten years ago. Finally the cost of uh, gas became too high for them to stay in business but they made a lot of beautiful things over their hundred year reign and they made a lot of things related to holiday and giftware as well so you're going to see some of those in here. Our next space here has a fun combination of vintage toys, old radios. Look at these great Buddy L and Keystone pieces up here. You rarely see these pieces and you almost never see them in any sort of condition other than fully rusted so it's really nice to see this one looks like it's in original condition with the ladder truck. Uh, they have it marked down to $1,100. I sold one for $1,250 this summer, so that's actually a pretty fair price. You just don't see these kind of big toys anymore. Uh, most of them uh, either got played with to death or during the Second World War, a lot of them were destroyed in scrap drives. So we really don't see very many selections like this. And then we've got some 60s era toys and advertising items as well. So this is definitely a fun booth. The Adams Grader in the back, the orange piece, is in remarkable condition. I just sold one of these in much worse condition. I have never seen one as perfect as that one, actually. We have the Alpine Station Raceway, old Lionel trains, and a little bit of Pyrex thrown in for good measure. So this is definitely a fun booth that's Definitely more in step with what people are collecting today. And we also have a fantastic space here to look at with wonderful Art Deco. These pieces are all original from the 1930s and 40s. You see the streamlined design, that piece of glass with the hair flowing. It's fantastic, looks like a big hood ornament. There's lamps there. This very unusual piece, a fox ashtray. Never seen that before. There's also uh, some nice cocktail ware, the Norman Bel Geddes pieces in the back there, the two um, for the carbonation. He was a big designer. He was one of the group that went to Paris in 1925 when the Americans were not invited to the Art Deco exposition because the French said everything we did was derivative. Norman Bel Geddes and some other designers went over to see what they were doing and came to the conclusion that the French were right. We really were copying everybody else. So they decided to set about making a truly uniquely American style and they came up with Streamline Modern. All these modern looking pieces with the streamlining, with the uh, illusion of speed, they are definitely the American response to that design era. And we made some beautiful things. And here are a bunch of them. Also, we have lighters ashtrays, a lot of novelty pieces. We're going to pull back here, see another really nice Art Deco set. That's Chase by the Chase Copper and Brass Company, who did a lot of chrome in the 1930s, which was a big seller because people didn't want to spend on silver anymore, and so chrome really became popular. They just have so much neat stuff in this space. I'm going to spend a little more time here so you can see it all. This set here of bookends is a Ronson set, and yes, that is Ronson who made the lighters. They made other items as well. During the Depression, a lot of companies that made one thing struck out into other areas because they had to to survive. So Ronson made ashtrays, they made bookends, they made all sorts of things out of metalwork, and some of theirs are very collectible now. On this shelf, we have the elephant lamp, which is also a Ronson piece. Dogs, and particularly terriers, whippets, greyhounds, anything that was very stylish looking became very popular as an Art Deco motif. There's a dresser box with, I believe, a whippet and uh, maybe a, an Airedale underneath? Can't quite tell. 
more lamps. The elephants were a very popular motif because the elephant with the trunk up was good luck. Uh, it's what that was to denote, and in the Depression people could use a little luck, so elephants with their trunk up became a very popular motif. These uh, lights and lamps are also very interesting here. Some really beautiful styles. We've got a really neat peach colored mirror. A lot of people, I'll get out of the reflection here, a lot of people have seen blue mirrored glass, but this is actually a peach shade. It's a little hard to tell with the reflection, but it is definitely not just white, which is definitely more unusual. We don't see that very often. Uh, this wall really does have a good selection of different kinds of things. I see everything in here from cameras and lenses, old Harley Davidson caps, anything that's truly old Harley is very collectible now. There's a shelf full of buckles, and this could be anything from Boston, the band in the 70s, and next to it you have Native American with the, or at least Native American style, I don't believe it's Native American, but it does have turquoise and coral with the eagle on it. Olympia beer is popular around here because they used to uh, brew just about 20 miles up the road. So you see a bunch of different things that appeals more to typically a guy audience or people who are at least uh, handy and good with woodworking. I'm always reluctant to sound too uh, gender specific because I know lots of women who are perfectly good with tools. But as far as our collectors, they do typically tend to be men. This booth here has a lot of cocktail rings, a lot of fun costume jewelry that's inexpensive and is vintage. And there's a big case up here as well. I'll zero in just for fun on this piece here. It is Claudia Agudelo, and so it is signed, it is sterling and coral, and it's a very handsome piece. Nice carving. Here, there are so many booths here, I'm just going to give you a taste of everything so you get a certain idea of the variety of things that are here. A lot of kitchenware and a lot of kitchen collectibles because that always has been and always is a popular area to collect because it's something people use every day. So you've got Corning and Pyrex well represented here. We're going to see more as we go through the mall. This space also has a bunch of records. Records are something that we see more interest in than ever because more and more people are listening to old music and more people are getting interested in old country music. So we're seeing bigger prices on country records than we used to because country has become a lot more mainstream. This, this is Lysi Brewing Company out of Peoria, the big tankard here with the set of glasses with the Middle Eastern motif. It's funny to think of today because these days we seem to have a lot of problems in the Middle East, but 100 to 120 years ago, Americans were fascinated with the Middle East and people from the Middle East, and so anything depicting those motifs and that life were very popular, and that's why you see them on a lot of beer-related items. Some very pretty beaded and mesh purses in here. These are very popular. A lot of people like to hang them on the wall, and then they just take the one off they want to use for the evening, and away they go. There's an interesting shape, that diamond shape for the hall tree, a little oak piece there. That's American from about 1900. The Fab 50s dinette set is a very popular thing these days. Used to be you saw them a lot, now not so much. So uh, this one, which is 240 with the chairs, is about the right price these days. Some very nice, handsome American oak back here as well. A lot of people do still like American oak because it's really well made and it's functional and it tends not to be overly ornamented. So it can fit into a lot of spaces better than maybe a more conspicuously carved piece of mahogany or some of the other woods that uh, were used. Nice little washstand with the rolling empire feet there. Over here, this is the book tunnel. All sorts of books and some pretty interesting ones, depending on your interests. I see everything from Zane Gray to, oh, Mysteries, Nancy Drew, bunch of various uh, authors. 
Now we come into an area that's a little hard to show you well, but I'm going to do my best because he's got great stuff. This dealer primarily does antique advertising and related items, general store items, advertising signs, tins. He's got a really nice selection and he has a big following. I believe he's based in somewhere here in the northwest between Seattle and Portland. He's known all over the west coast for the type of things that he gets. Uh, he's a big fixture at shows. These old milk bottles are actually made of metal. You, sorry about the glare, let's get on this side of them. They were the ones that you would actually throw things at in the carnival to knock down for prizes. Here we have some old tip trays and record cleaners. Mapleine, the AYP Souvenir 1909. That is because Crescent Manufacturing was in Seattle and the 1909 Seattle World's Fair had a feature about Crescent and so they gave these out there. Very hard to find now. World's Fairs were often touted as places to get awards and then brag about them. Here's an example. This is a little pocket mirror for Vartre Water Company having won gold medals at the Paris, Buffalo, Charleston, and St. Louis fairs. We're going to pull out here. There's a neat old Gilmore Lion gas station sign. This guy's very careful about not buying reproduction, so if you see stuff in here, it's going to be real, which is great. Uh, one thing I really like about this antique mall is that they are very careful about representing things accurately. You're not going to buy something here and go home and find out that it's a fake and that you paid too much because they will guarantee it and take it back. This is a really amazing piece here. Everett Eret Optometrist. Look at the three-dimensional painting on that crazy eye. This would have actually been a sign that would have sat on top of a uh, lighted pillar and so it's called a globe sign. You usually see them for gas and oil. You don't see them a lot for other businesses, but they did make some. Next to it is a light up Coca-Cola sign. That one's gonna date probably to about 1950. And that's a hard piece to find in good condition. We see a lot of Coke stuff, not that sign generally. Monarch coffee, that's a really cool piece with the lion on it. Keeping these bottles filled with Monarch coffee will add pleasure to every meal. It certainly added pleasure to the owners of Monarch Coffee, I'm sure. 19th hole is a little bisque flask from right after Prohibition. This is tastefully covered, so we'll just show you. There is a lovely dude photo. Those were definitely very hard to come by in the old days because even if they were art, they weren't necessarily seen as such. So a lot of places didn't allow you to have them. So finding old nudes is actually a real trick. And I will take a step back here. We'll see the old Richardson root beer barrel, which is a fixture in 1950s, 40s, 50s era. Uh, this would have been something that could have been used in a store counter or possibly taken out to traveling events. Now we're in a different space entirely. This is salt and pepper land. And boy, are there a lot of them. There are Shawnee, there are ones that look like shells, there's one that looks like corn. I like the football and megaphone. That was actually a treasure craft of California design. They were the ones who came up with the idea of doing thematic rather than matching pairs. And so that's a cool thing to see. We're gonna take a walk down the center aisle here just to give you an idea of the size of the store. This space is known primarily for porcelain figurines. If you know someone who likes any kind of animal, there's probably a Bing and Grondel, Royal Copenhagen, Royal Dalton, Royal Worcester, Heron, or other maker who did their animal. And so if you're looking for some obscure animal figure for someone who likes something that you don't see often, well, an antique store like this may be the place to look. There's the Little Mermaid from Denmark. Royal Worcester November Child's figure. Birds, etc. So, an old transit. That is something that we see used in civil engineering and we don't see out for sale in antique stores very often. 
Now, this dealer is a very experienced longtime dealer who are well known in glass and kitchenware circles. They used to uh, have the Fenton Glass Finders Club. They were the heads of that. They've been around the business for many, many years. I, they are known as Coe's Mercantile Online, and they really have a great eye for what is currently popular. Most of these patterns that they're carrying are things that were done in the 1970s, like the Indian Summer by Corning and the Corel wear that went with. They also are carrying, I noticed, a lot of Avon Cape Cod, because again, this is something that people of a younger age remember, because anyone whose grandmother distributed Avon brought you home a whole case full of it. Like I say, these folks have been involved with Fenton glass for a long time. These hobnail topaz colored opalescent pieces are a very hard color to find. Here's a space with a lot of Corel again, and we're seeing a lot of Corel in this store because it's really selling now. This is something that is familiar and recognizable to people who are in their 30s, 40s, 50s today because a lot of us grew up with this in our parents' kitchen. And so you'll see all sorts of different patterns here, some unusual pieces like this uh, spice canister that were go-alongs. And you'll see it comes in all sorts of patterns, including plain French white. So uh, very usable today, even still, and a lot of people starting to collect this now. English porcelain, this floral centerpiece, very hard to find in good shape. Royal Adderley did those in the 1960s. They were very popular at the time. Not many of them have survived intact. You'll see a lot around. You won't see many that don't have a chip or a crack. So that makes that one kind of special. Some silver jewelry here. Linens are something we see in abundance in this store. These pieces here are cranberry. It requires 24 karat gold in the batch to make this color of glass. You can't get that shade any other way. So it always was more expensive because the materials were more expensive and it's still very collectible now. They also have Royal Ruby. This is what replaced Cranberry in the marketplace for general glass, because in the 1930s, Anchor Hawking figured out how to make a deep red color that did not require 24 karat gold. So there's a lot of collectors for that. And then this piece here, the Cranberry color is flashed on. It actually is not part of the glass. That's why part of the glass is clear. If you look closely, you'll see that this was actually fired on and that's why it has that gold appearance, because it's actually a metallic salt that gives it that color while the piece is cooling down. So those you don't want to dishwash. The rest of this stuff you can. Franciscan's apple pattern is one of the most popular ever made. We still have collectors for that. Forest Green came out by Anchor Hawking around the same time as the Royal Ruby. And then up above we see a few pieces of Franciscan Starburst. This fantastic 50s era dinnerware is probably the most popular pattern currently being collected by new collectors. And boy, is it fun. Came out in 1955. They made it for about 10 years. I think if it came out again today, they could make it another 10 years. It's just fantastic. The green bottle in the middle, that is a Blanco 920. That is sea green. That was designed by Winslow Anderson in the early 1950s uh, when he was their first designer in West Virginia. The crackling is achieved, you can see it up close here. When they take this piece of glass and it's still 1500 or 2000 degrees, they dunk it in cold water really quickly and pull it out really fast. It causes all of the surface to crack, but the internal heat of the glass still being so hot fuses it all together so it doesn't fall apart. It just gives it this really great crackling effect on the exterior, a fun bunch of Again, Fenton pieces, more novelty pieces, but also a uh, teapot here by Lefton. This is an unusual one because she has the braid and the tea pours out of her braid. I haven't seen this one before. We usually see Miss Pris, who's a kitty cat, uh, and similarly decorated. We still see a lot of interest in old magazines, particularly things that either relate to a collection such as train magazines, or old life and Saturday evening post. A lot of times people are buying those either for a particular article or because it was 
put out on someone's birthday and they give it as a birthday gift. This booth's got some different kind of fun things. A lot of crock kitchenware, a lot of yellowware bowls, a lot of these pieces were produced in America in the 1930s and 40s. We've got the blue banded, we've got the red and white band with the ornate edge. That's a little harder to find. Below we see spongeware where the decoration was applied originally with a sponge. And then we see a whole lot of Fiesta. Most of these are 1980s colors. Fiesta has been made since the 1930s and it is always more desirable than there is production. Fiesta never can keep up with production, so there's always people looking on the secondary market for pieces they couldn't get new. For Northwest interest, this is a football signed by the entire Huskies team, and it looks to me that we have a couple of signatures from guys who went to the NFL, but I'll have to spend a little bit more time with that. Sports memorabilia is very popular. We don't see it often, and it doesn't seem to stay in stock when we do. On the left is the classic Hamilton Beach green mixer from the 1950s. Next to a daisy croc. These are items we see sell quite readily. And then up above, we've got an interesting selection of lanterns. The right is a shorter one, which is a roadside lantern. The taller one, the medium sized one here is a railroad lantern. And then the taller ones are other types of lanterns, mainly for home use and that sort of thing. And that's why they're taller because they didn't have to worry about them blowing over like the railroad and the roadside crews did. Again, a little bit of Olympia beer because we're near where they brewed it. The Dewey train engine, old floor trains were very much like those big toys, the metal toys that I showed you before, in that they were something people rode around on as little kids, and they didn't last, so finding any of those is really hard now. There's a bunch of neat old toys here as well. Rubber toys, metal toys, cast iron toys, some midget race cars that are hard to find from the 1940s and 50s. And then this is really unusual, this little ad piece here. It's just a very basic metal tin car from the 1930s, but the ad is Roatan Cigars, an auto a day is given away. You can win a brand new 1939 Chevrolet, I'm sure, by smoking cigars and sending in the wrappers or something. That is a very unusual piece. This is a neat one here, too, that anyone alive in the 50s might remember. This is the Wyandotte Emergency Auto Service. The cab was plastic, that was a new thing in the 50s, but the back end's still metal, and it is in really good shape. The graphics are not scratched or faded or rusted off, so that's a nice thing to see. We also have the Structo Transport here. This even has a couple of cars on top. It looks like 1950s era Cadillacs. And in front to the right is a little Ford uh, Hubley tow truck from the 50s as well. Go up past the Santa lamp here, and we'll see one more neat old Tonka toy in the back there. This one is the steel carrier. Speaking of carriers, next to it we have an old post office letter carrier's hat. That's a pretty unusual thing to see. Most of these things stay in collections with the family, and so to have one come out where we can actually enjoy it is really cool. And then for you Petroliana folks, there's a whole string of big gas station sized oil cans. Conoco Super, Texaco, Shell, Pennzoil, and of course Pegasus on mobile, which is probably the most popular of the logos related to oil and Petroliana. More oil related here. Old oil cans, of course they haven't made them this way in years. These are all still full, very hard to find. Lion head is particularly rare. We also have an oilsome clock. 1950s advertising clocks are very popular now, much more popular than mantle clocks or kitchen clocks from the 1800s these days. And it's 
partly because of the cool graphics and partly because most of them had pretty cheap movements and they broke and got thrown away. So there really are not a lot around. If you want to torment your family, you could put locks on the restrooms and then they could come to you when they need to get in. You could even charge them a nickel or a dime like they did in the old days. It's so funny to tell people these days that you actually used to have to pay to use the toilet. <laughs> car related again the Boyce Moto meter this is a particularly nice one with the winged face that is out of the 1920s these would have been the way you would have told if your car was going to boil over because the meter is right there and this would have sat as your hood ornament and you could see if it was boiling over as you were driving some interesting little bits here. The Bellingham Fireman's Badge is a hard piece to find. The badge on top is from the Ford Auto Plant. Below we have an advertising mirror for your visor. Back before there were mirrors on visors, you could get something like this. And here it is, Phillips 66. And then you're supposed to use a grease pencil to mark down when you put oil in, when you lubricate, have you checked the battery. So that's a pretty unusual piece. And then some big oil-related. There's a neat piece. We've got an old Coke button. We've got a big Penn's oil stand that uh, stood outside of one of the gas stations. And an even bigger, the world's first Valvoline Motor Oil Company. For you Coca-Cola folks, they've got great calendars, great store displays and pushes. And then for local interest in the West, it's Rainier Club, Extra Pale Beer. And it was at one time. Rainier was definitely the beer to have around here. These are the apothecary jars that have become very popular as dresser accessories and to use in kitchens and all sorts of places. And because we're in this part of the country, we're going to notice some skookum. We also see some interesting little pieces here. E.J. Riley Ackrington. Ackrington, where the billiard tables come from, that's an English piece. Ackrington is actually the only town in England that ever had its soccer team fail. They had the Ackrington Stanley. They're the only club in the history of the English League to go out of business. So there's a little claim to fame for them. Book banks are popular from all over the country. This is a nice one from National Bank of Washington on the left. They line up like little books in your bookcase and could be stored in a way where people might not even notice them, which was the idea. The shoehorn, which is celluloid, advertises a golf ball. That's a pretty nice early piece. You don't see a lot of golf memorabilia. The diamond die cabinet is sold. I wonder what they got for that. They've got some other neat cabinets here too. I noticed some more coffee and tea blends. This one's from an old A&P store over here, so if you are from the East Coast, you might recognize that piece. U.S. tires. Slow children. Always felt bad for the slow children if they had only been a little faster. Dairyland milk. Butternut bread. Needham Coconut. Well, I need them to go now, but I hope you enjoyed today's video. Centralia's Antique District is off of Washington's I-5 exit 82. And meanwhile, we'll be back to see more of the town. But in the meantime, if you'd like to see more videos, please hit the subscribe button below. Please hit the thumbs up to like this video. And you may leave comments below as well. We look forward to seeing them and click the bell to get notified when new videos are uploaded. Bye-bye for now. This is George at the Antique Nomad.